Welcome uh, to today's session on moving from infertility to adoption. I'm Tom Tyholtz. I write the, uh, the award-winning Tommy Wood Arts and Culture column, and I wrote an article, a four-part series on my own uh, male uh, journey in male infertility to adoption called um, Motility, which is available on Amazon. And with me today are Cindy Chupak and Ian Wallach, who are married, though if you read Cindy's book, The Longest Date, Life as a Wife, you won't really believe it because she says so many nice things about him <laughs> that, it, that it's hard to believe. She, he must really have some dirt on her. <laughs> yeah, no, no, clearly he has major dirt on you. And, and, and uh, Cindy is the Emmy Award winning writer and producer of such memorable shows as Sex in the City, um, as she writes for, Mo she's written for Modern Family, and she is uh, currently developing a pilot based on this book, which is very exciting. And Ian is an attorney. Um, he's uh, handled uh, criminal cases, constitutional law cases. He defended Guantanamo, uh, Guantanamo Bay detainees, because I, 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 he got me out of there, and I really appreciate it. So I get a little choked up. But you know, you, you just, you, you send money to one guy in Islamabad, and <laughs> that's all it takes now. But, um, but uh, uh, Ian also uh, wrote a very moving chapter that's in the book that's from the sort of the male point of view. And uh, there's a couple of people we want to thank um, and acknowledge before we get into this. Uh, first of all, uh, Vista Darmar and Lynn Baumhoff, who's standing in the uh, back of the room. Um, Vista Del Mar is one of Los Angeles's greatest uh, social service organizations. It's one of the oldest. It's more than 100 years old. They do great work uh, with kids of all ages, and all three of us actually, um, our adoptions are through with the help of Vista Del Mar, and they have a booth upstairs which we encourage you to go to and where Cindy will be signing her book after this session. Um, and also, uh, and they're the sponsors of this panel. We want to thank, um, you can learn more about all the speakers and sponsors and book appointments uh, by going to fertilityplanet.com. You can watch videos there for free. We want to thank Fora.tv for live streaming this. And of course, we thank you all for being here. If you want to tweet in questions, which somehow they will magically tell us about, um, uh, the hashtag is FPLA14. So. Uh, let's just jump into this. And uh, in Cindy's book, she talks about her courtship, her single days, her courtship, her marriage, and I want to skip all that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I want to cut straight to that moment after you're married, and people say, "So when are you going to get pregnant? When are you going to have a kid?" And talk about those first five years uh, that uh, you describe in your book. Well, the person saying that to me was Ian. <laughs> And I think for a lot of men, they don't really get married till they're, re you know, why do they have to is kind of my theory, but until they're ready to have a kid. So he was ready on day one. And I, after having been single and written about it and, and day waited. one was like six months before the wedding. So <laughs> it was hours after we'd agreed to the marriage. It was set in stone. And that was, that was day one. Yeah. yeah, I wrote in my book, uh, after he proposed, I threw my... I threw my birth control into the ocean in a gesture of good faith and love, and I immediately was like, wow, what have I done? <laughs> Which, if you're here at this seminar, probably seems like, why did we even keep taking those for so long? <laughs> but anyway, at the time, I... I um, but I had feelings about wanting to just be married for five... I wished we could just be married for five years before I had to try to have a baby, but I knew we were too old because we got married at 40, and, um, and then it took us five years plus of kind of going through everything probably a lot of you have gone through or thought about. And um, and that's kind of what the book was about, is what did we learn during that five years about each other and being a couple and also our journey from, you know, all the plan A to plan B to plan C to plan D and finally um, the child we've adopted, which I will say makes it all, all worthwhile. But, but you did um, initially get pregnant right away. Yes. Yeah. We you want to? <laughs> I, 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 can, I can hit that. Um, okay. You'll just tell me what degree to go into. <laughs> um, yeah, and actually Cindy writes about it very beautifully. Um, we, got, we got pregnant on our honeymoon, um, and that was very, you know, very picturesque and very excited. We got, you know, the great news early on and the great news early on, and then we got, um, you know, tragic news. Uh, 
13, I guess, 11, 11 weeks into it. And it was so, I remember it crystal clearly because we were at our, our doctor and he'd been so supportive and he'd been with Cindy for years and he was just so happy. Just remember, just <laughs> yeah. regular old OBGYNs and then we got into the world of you never see a regular OBGYN again. But and he called us then. like so happy and, and we, you know, gave us the news and he came in and he was so happy and then he walked out the room and he came in and he looked at the screen again and his face just went totally white. And, um, and then he went out and, and, and that's what, and then he, he basically said, listen, this is, isn't good. And then we sent, he sent us to somebody else who was incredibly, I forget his name, he was so matter of fact. He was just like, all right, so it's probably not gonna live, it's probably not gonna get to birth. If it does, it might only live till it's about 10, it's missing this, the heart doesn't look like this. Unless you're deeply religious, don't, don't, don't go through with this. And, um, and that was the beginning of, uh, of our but even, even then, you didn't yet know that you had to go to a specialist yet. Right, so we kind of had the false sense of, wow, we got pregnant right away, which I am embarrassed to say after trying for so long, I was kind of freaked out that we got pregnant right away because we had just gotten married, and I felt like torn about it. And then, of course, I felt guilty about that, which if any of you have gone through fertility, you look back at all the times you maybe had a pregnancy scare or were pregnant, and didn't want to be, and you think like, why didn't I just embrace it? But anyway, point is, don't, you can't help but beat yourself up, but I, it wasn't, uh, maybe it wasn't meant to be, who knows, but I, um, we, you know, so we had to go through being hopeful that we were having a baby to the process of figuring out how to terminate because it wasn't going to make it to term, and and then after that, we really tried on our own for about a year, and then it pretty quickly became clear we should be trying IVF. And I always thought we're never going to do be those people who get into that crazy thing, as you know, and then suddenly you are those people. <laughs> and actually, and doctor, you're reading everything and you're trying to understand everything, and you're arguing even though neither of you are doctors or have gone to a, you have a bachelor of science or anything. Yeah, and we went to Dr. Mars actually, who was just here. I don't know how many of you were here at the last session, but I think what finally, you know, we I wasn't producing a lot of eggs, and um, it wasn't. I don't know we. I'll just tell you briefly, and then if you want to ask questions about any step, because I don't want to go through too much of our... Per but we kind of went through IVF for a few not great rounds. I didn't produce a lot of eggs. We tried a few times and got maybe like a positive pregnancy that then would go away, or they would call it a spontaneous... No, that was... Yeah. Something. Uh, chemical pregnancy. Chemical. Yeah, I was like, what does that mean? So, <laughs> and then we finally kind of got our head around um, egg donor, which was a step, and I wrote about uh, it in the book. Let me just stop yeah. you right there, because yeah. um, from the male point of view, we tried for two years. You know, we thought like, oh yeah, we're going to be married, have those two years of not answering anybody's questions, and then after two years and lots of trying, we weren't pregnant, and the doctor said, you know, you should both get tested, and uh, as you said, some doctors you know, they really don't have the bedside manner that they should. And I went to some, uh, I don't know if any of you, but in New York City, everybody knows the best person. Yeah. And he's hard to get to, yeah. and they have to make a call, but he's the only person, he's the best. Until someone knows someone in Colorado, you really must fly. Well, no, no, but that's or after even the, worse, the valley. Yeah. Which is just... <laughs> which you wouldn't do. No. But, but, but so I went to see this best guy who... If you can call a urologist a dick, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 this guy was, because he said, oh, yeah, with sperm like yours, you're, you're not going to have a kid. <laughs> and I literally, well, he claims I fainted. I claim <laughs> something else. But, but, but it you was very, all, all the air left the room at that moment. And um, we then entered uh, the world of, you know, infertility treatments. And there's a line here that I just picked up from one of the people downstairs, one of the doctors who, who, he says, regardless of the particular roadblock to conception, there is always hope. And that's right, you're in the hope factory. So uh, talk a little bit about when you were in that hope factory. There's always something else you can try, and all the things you thought you'd never do, suddenly you're there doing them. We, yeah, I mean, mostly I didn't have to do much other than some embarrassing well, rooms and doctor's offices <laughs> and stuff, but, really but, great but, homework. But, but, but who um, knew you would become reacquainted with pornography yeah, exactly. and encouraged oh, to do so? Uh, there was a disastrous, I don't know, so, uh, yeah, I don't know how, uh, we're on TV. Um, 
so like the first time I go into a place like that, you know, they're like here and the videos are here and it's all sterile and weird and you, it's just all strange. And then I put on the porn and I, I'm, I mean, it was gay porn. And I was like, wait a minute, what? No. And, and then there was another one, seriously, there was a, there was a and I don't, I don't even know where this came up with. How, how even when it comes up with, maybe they thought that was sensitive, but the premise was a couple was crying over the loss of their baby and it turned into lovemaking. And I was like, are you kidding me? L- listen, are you friggin'? I, I, <laughs> I was in a room in Century City Hospital, and the video was of two nurses who get too overly friendly. <laughs> and I thought, like, irony much? I mean, like... Um. Yeah, I th- you kind of got the feeling that people at Fertility Clinic didn't try to curate the porn that much, you know. But you know so, wait, well, or if I they do. did, what was their criteria? <laughs> or maybe so it's about yeah, one. like whoa. It's emotionally relevant, but Ian was like, "You need to." We look can, at we that. can also. I mean, Sydney and I, Sydney and I can talk. We can tell you about the stories. We can tell you about the things we tried to do, or the things that we we were pretty much open to absolutely, you know, everything. We wanted to have no, a kid. We do have a kid. Once at a time. But but right. But and um. But all the way over here, we were talking about like you know what what was the um, what, what kind of messages did we each want to convey? And I, I don't know if this is the right time to just. Anytime. Good. For me, it was just one thing only. Like I got so friggin' sick of unsolicited advice. I don't think our culture is anywhere near where it should be when it comes to adoption or privacy or moving on. Um, it, it got to a point where so many people were like, well, you know, oh, it's going to happen as soon as you stop trying. You hear that all the time. Um, things that are really callous. Guys will make jokes like, why don't I try? You know, it's just. It's so embedded. I, I was told of those it's opportunities. So <laughs> my, my so we tried everything. We didn't try that. Uh, my, my, my mother suggested when I but told her that the doctor said the problem with me, she said, you should sleep with some other girls, see if you get them pregnant. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Also I, I, ended, I ended up actually being able to you know, just tell people, hey, I didn't ask you. And um, for a while, it felt really good. Like, it felt like, you know, they thought I was being obnoxious or rude. But I thought, hey, listen, you know, no, I didn't ask you that. I don't want your advice. I'd rather go to somebody who knows what they're talking about than someone. And I also thought that maybe if I got that person just to not say something that, that, that even though that wasn't expected to hurt, did, then it would save somebody else from that happening down the line. So that's the one thing I just feel. It's totally free to tell people, hey, uh, I didn't ask. And it might even be a cool thing. And it's totally fun to laugh with other people who are going about you about the stupid incredibly stupid things that people say. Well, when your wife's standing on her head, <laughs> right? Right, which, I mean, that advice, you say, well, all right, we'll try that. Well, also, the last thing I'll add is that is the origin of that is, is people, I mean, when they, when they hear some of the tragedies that, that, that we may be going through, that people may be going through in this, uh, that they're inside, they're afraid that that might happen to them. And by, by saying that there's something supernatural or something good or whatever, they're really not worried about you. And it's not me, and it's just they're comforting and a, a, a fear in themselves. And it's, uh, while I understand that, you know, just it's easy to just you know, look at it with sympathy, nod it off, and, please, and tell them, please, thanks, move on. And also, any success validates whatever crazy thing you did before. Right. <laughs> Those story, but what you talked about, hope, I wrote about this in my book, but I felt like the roller coaster of hope I was on was a very complicated one because, um, you know, if you're a person who's used to being able to materialize what you want in your life, career-wise or just any in any way, it's very frustrating to suddenly enter this world where you really have very little control over it. And I felt that kind of dating for a long time, like I'm waiting for this person. And, and then with the baby thing, it just felt like we're doing everything right, we're doing everything everyone tells us. Um, except for we're old. <laughs> it finally <laughs> occurred to me I was old. <laughs> that was something I was just sort of like, oh. We can only afford a child. <laughs> we can afford <laughs> it. Like but um, what I didn't understand and what I wanted to convey, I was thinking coming over, is there's all these things you can try, but you really have to be ready for each step. And each step a requires journey. a period of mourning the step before. Right. And just because you started out wanting a biological child, because that's just normal, and you maybe grew up thinking that's how it would happen, um, it doesn't mean you won't be able to accept later you know, other options. Like egg donor, to me, for a long time was like, well, if I'm not going to be part of it. Ian was joking that like, well, if you're not part of it, we don't need to pass on my messed up genes. Cause, <laughs> and, um, and I kind of laughed and thought that was true. But then at a certain point, I was like, do you w- want, would, should we? And he was really excited that we were going to try egg donor. So I thought egg donor, then I just carry the baby. That's like the least exciting <laughs> part of the whole thing. But, um, but then I did start to like the idea that we would go through the pregnancy together, that we would um, be able to make sh- ensure the health of you know the prenatal care and we would sort of have the baby book that seemed kind of like everyone else's baby book and it wasn't like we were going to lie and not admit we ha- used an egg donor. I was actually going to be very out about that we used an egg donor and be that couple that we would <laughs> be like very proud of it and then um 
And then I had, after we told everyone and it worked and everyone knew how and what we'd been through, I, um, I had like a miscarriage at 14 weeks. Mm -hmm. That was a very traumatic, horrible blah thing because we went to the hospital, then we were sent home, and then it happened at home, and then we went back to the hospital. So that's a chapter in my book, and that's something Ian wrote about, not just... Um, it was just a, it was hard on every level because it was like we were doing. I when the doctors were talking earlier about how you can do it, you know, they said you can do it at any time. There wasn't really an explanation we ever got that was satisfactory of why I didn't carry it to term. We had seen healthy sonograms right before, so that lack of an answer was the most frustrating thing of all. We tried to get a biopsy, or you know, because it was like, why couldn't I carry it? It wasn't my egg anymore. It was this young. <coughs> healthy girl cocktail waitress in New York City. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why? <laughs> What's happening? So because that didn't work, Dr. Mars, I really appreciated this. We finally asked him, if I was your daughter, what would you tell me? And he said, you know, since we don't know why you weren't able to carry the term, I don't know if I'd recommend you trying again. And we kind of both felt when we were in the hospital after that, miscarriage, so we'd already had the one termination, lots of infertility, the miscarried egg donor baby. I think we both looked at each other even that night and said, like, we're done. We're done, yeah. It was done. And it felt like we always, Ian especially, had been very open to adoption from the beginning, and I had been open, um, but we just had to go through these steps, and I know with friends who were trying to get pregnant at the same time, sometimes I would say, well, if you're open to adoption, it takes the pressure off, right? Because you can always have a baby. But it doesn't necessarily because you're just not there yet. And then sometimes it makes you so sad to think you're not going to – it's hard to give up. Like, to me, it felt like being at a blackjack table and, you know, you were down, but you'd been there so long, like you were going to get You lucky. didn't want to walk away from the table. And everybody else would say – that, you know, it happens or it happened or, you know, it's just hard to let go. But um, but when you said we're done, did you feel like you were ready for the for, for adoption or was there an, uh, a point where you had to kind that of That was like something else I wanted to say yeah. that uh, Ian was. So the other thing about this journey, even though it seems endless, is there were periods that I just needed to step off the treadmill and be sad because I remember Ian was like, let's move on to adoption. And I was like, I can't even go in an adoption attorney's office and be excited yet. I don't know when I'm going to feel excited again. And I know we don't have the time, but it just felt like we've got to take a break. And I think for men especially, that break probably seems very frustrating and hard. And like, why don't we just pursue this? Because it's going to take a while anyway. But I just really appreciated that he gave me the time to just mourn and get through what we had been in and kind of regroup and get on to a new thing. And when we decided for real to do adoption, we talked to friends who had adopted, friends who had given up children for adoption, friends who had um, who were adopted, and kind of international, domestic, we explored a lot. And it took a while to just sort of get our head back around it. But then um, I will say that once we finally decided, because of everything we'd been through, to me, and I kind of wrote this in my book, I felt like that woman in the television ad, like, I'm cleaning my bathroom bowl. Like, <laughs> I felt like, I'm having a baby. I could be at a party or <laughs> someone's having my baby. It was like such pressure was taken off, even though adoption can be hairy. For me, having gone through it with my own body and being the person responsible to create this child, even when it was an egg donor, to carry this child for nine months, to just talk to birth mothers who were seven months pregnant, um, I was very zen about it. Like, if it worked out, it's meant to work out. And if it doesn't, we didn't invest nine months. You know, it was... It, it and you will could actually out. have sex that was sex. You could have sex <laughs> just <laughs> for sex. And yeah. Because in the infertility process, suddenly it's almost as it's if that's the, 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 the desire to have this baby becomes an obstacle in a way in your sex and married life. Yeah, it totally I, makes I it a business. I was really thankful for Cindy. Um, uh, I mean, uh, we were done... Uh, The, the thing I wrote or whatever, but I, I've been in, in contact. And then you know, when, when when you lose someone, you turn to your buddies. You, you, you can talk about it. And you know, I think we got off, I think we got off so easy. I have friends who've had 17 miscarriages, mm. uh, um, which is just I, I can't even do the math. Um, and they're that married to the idea, and it's not my job to say, hey, listen, you know, there's other other things out there. Uh, but it was I was really glad that once once we decided, then it became and adoption's not easy. I mean, it's a it's a crazy 
competitive market and it's a capitalist society and you have to put out your best face and make believe that you're someone born we'll, we'll, we'll on the Mr. Rogers show and uh, <laughs> it's it's but but you, but you do it and um, the one other thing I wanted to add in is um, and I don't whatever p paths people take I'm so happy if you're here the chances are, are pretty astronomical that you're going to end up with a child uh, we found ourselves at a place like this we ended up with a child we couldn't we couldn't be happier um, I was raised my, my dad was never around much and he was sort of gone uh, in the community I work in which which is law um, being an active parent you know making sure the kids are covered is one thing but being actively involved isn't really that high on a priority. Every adoptive parent, every adoptive dad I know is so integrally involved in their kids' lives. They are so absolutely appreciative. They make the time to be there. And you, chances are that, that if you're here, that, that, that you're gonna get there and you're gonna get that option. So. Well, your parents by choice. Yeah. You know, and, and that, uh, that in of itself shows a certain engagement that, that uh, um, ends up, you end up following through. Uh, during the, the uh, once you decide to uh, adopt, and I, I know you, I have the opposite experience, which is that I'm glad that one day my wife came in and said, baby in the house, <laughs> baby in the house. I don't care, you know, and I was, uh, I was reluctant. I was, I was reluctant about everything, but, but, but I was, um, um, I was reluctant. I, my parents uh, are Holocaust survivors. I had this whole thing about the end of my line. You know, I was like, oh, I don't know. Everything, she said, okay, while you're thinking about that, we're getting on this, you know, trains leaving the station, we're getting on it. And we started the process, and while we were, while we were in the adoption process, we still did another IVF. Uh, there came a moment when, when my wife, Amy, was, we were pregnant, and we didn't know, and we said, well, let's just, we'll do both, you know. And then she miscarried. And I, I'm so grateful that she didn't give me the time to think about it mm -hmm. and forged ahead. Because the thing is, is that adoption really is the sure thing. The infertility is the hope factory. Now, for everyone that it works out for, it's fantastic. And, you know, it's a wonderful, amazing scientific thing that they, all these things they can do. And all, you know, it's wonderful. But as, you, as Ian was just saying, there are a lot of kids out there, a lot of babies out there. And uh, for someone who really wants to be a parent, uh, adoption, you know, will work out. And uh, tell me a little bit but about your- uh, On that, if, if you think people gave you unsolicited advice about fertility, if you go the adoption route, it's it's even it's even worse. Everybody has an, an issue. If you do adopt from somewhere, don't adopt from somewhere. Uh, where you should adopt from? Where you should, uh, you know, we bought domestic. It's a bad line, but it's true. Uh, <laughs> she, uh, I don't know if we can tell about what, what, what your father said and what your, your response was. Um, <laughs> Put you on the spot. He, he wanted his a dad Jewish. Had, his dad, uh, her dad has some old school racist Jewish ideas and said, you know, uh, well, we need you to adopt a Jewish child, not a black child. And so he goes, well, we're adopting a black Jew from Ethiopia. And, uh, <laughs> I started to realize, like, I just want to adopt awesome. whatever will be most <laughs> offensive to my dad. I was getting so angry. <laughs> but uh, but there, in truth, it, there was a point where we thought we were going to adopt internationally. And um, we realized <laughs> when we went to this adoption seminar that Ian had always wanted to adopt from Africa and I wanted to adopt from China. And they were, like, totally different breakout sessions. <laughs> and we were like we couldn't seem to reconcile our child and it kept making us seem vaguely racist, racist. to have conversations <laughs> about like why. Well, you don't like, well, you don't like. <laughs> right, that's not what I'm saying. And then I will say, and we have a lot of friends who've adopted internationally and have had amazing experiences. And I have friends who have two biological children and then adopt their third internationally from China and they kind of love the experience for their whole family. And their two boys watched the video of them bringing home their little girl and they all talked about it together. And so there's a zillion ways and we also knew people going through fertility for their second child that were having just as much heartache as we were, which is hard to get your head around when you're waiting for your first child. But I understand, like, you, one thing I feel like I learned is just you can't judge. And you also can't um, put yourself on the spectrum of mitigating what hardship you're going through because I think we did hear about people who'd been through 15 IVFs or 17, and so I think, well, we, or, my miscarriage felt late because it was 14 weeks, but we heard of people 
you know, live births or, or stillbirths or, you know, at 36 weeks and you feel like, well, that's so much worse and you almost feel like I can't talk about this because mine doesn't seem as bad or we haven't tried as long or... And um, I just came around to, like, whatever, it's your horrible. <laughs> and it's... And you still ha are going to have these, what my therapist called an emotional flu every once in a while, where you just need to stay home and take care of yourself and, um, you know, you got to get through it. And and don't it be open. It helped me open up and realize what my friends had gone through who had told me before we tried this that they had had a miscarriage. I probably didn't even understand the depth of what that meant to them. And just, you know, now I do. But I'd also just let yourself grieve whatever you are grieving even if it's it doesn't seem that big if you're at places like this and it feels like well at least we haven't gone through that maybe you know just we're all on this spectrum it's all hard <laughs> well let's talk a little bit about the process of adoption though and uh, uh you know how vista del mar the attorney how what that experience was like and what was involved with that we we had a couple of different options um, i was working in the public sector then um and I felt a little guilty about wanting to go through the private sector, but only just because we, we knew this. We'd had great, heard great stories about this one lawyer, and he basically said, listen, if you, if you go in, people had said he was a jerk. Oh, sorry, people had said that this guy was a jerk. He, he, he's probably watching us, but uh, he, he wasn't. Um, they said, listen, you, you, know, you go there, you, know, you do this, you're going to come out with a baby in 14 months um, or less. And it's exactly what happened. Um, you know, we, we went to this lawyer, and he was also connected to Vista Del Mar. The same one that Tom went to. Yes, but yeah. and then I was also at Vista Del Mar, so this is by coincidence. But yes, within a year of our first uh, meeting with him, um, uh, we had our daughter. And uh, we did have a situation about three weeks after uh, we met him. He called us up and said, uh, there's a woman. She's nine months pregnant. Do you want to go meet her? And we said, sure, because we were still in the like, oh, we better, you know. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, really adoption is about choice. That's what we came to learn. You, you choose the person and they choose you. And, and, and it's really about making that match. But this woman seemed like, on paper, she was the sort of the bad seed of a good family. So, you know, in my genetic calculations, that seemed like that was okay. And uh, uh, um, uh, and she was about to give birth, and she was so far along that um, you you couldn't do a standard ultrasound. So we had to we paid to have her go to Cedars to have some super. And the person and I didn't go. My wife went, and the person doing the other is going one, two, <laughs> two. Oh, there and the and they and they called us up and they said. Well, it's twins. Are you still interested? And then my wife is talking to her. She says, you know, there seems to be a gap of three months in your thing. And she goes, oh, you know, I, I was in prison for, I've been doing meth. You know, I've been doing meth for, during the first trimester. So that was, a, and, and then we had to take off a few months after that because that was such a heartbreak because it was so suddenly. But but again, it's a yeah, journey. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to. Less than anybody's experience, and, and, and drug drugs were a huge. Not that I have any like issue of morality. It was just for for childcare, and, and we, we, it was something we wanted to try to control up, have control over. That said, some of the people who helped us through uh, the adoption process were were neighbors of ours. Um, they adopted uh, three kids out of the LA County pool. Um, their their second child, uh, mom was a, was a heroin addict. Uh, the child is unbelievably. Uh, beautiful and smart and healthy and incredible. Uh, they got a phone call three years after that. They said, well, the mom's going back to prison. She now has AIDS. She's still, um, uh, and she, uh, she's pregnant again. Uh, do you want the other child? And they, they went for it, and the child did not convert, does not have uh, any type of disease, and is in uh, some of the best private schools in LA and incredibly happy and absolutely well, beautiful. Actually, and that, the, the, end so, of, yeah. the end of my story is that when we actually uh, uh, when our daughter was born, the hospital she was in, the two nurses in the nurseries were both adoptive moms of uh, uh, of crack babies. Mm -hmm. So there, okay. there, the whole point is that there are people, there is a parent for each situation, and it's really about choice and about you feeling this is the right match. That first right, situation... What I wanted to add is... is, is um, 
don't, if, you, if, you, if an opportunity presents itself, that's where you are, and you hear about drug history, talk to your doctor before yeah. you make an automatic no choice, because that might, it might actually be Is it, And there's a big difference in horrible. which drugs and what the, okay. uh, we had that conversation. But you have these crazy conversations you never thought you'd have with your lawyer, like, uh, you know, does it matter to you? Suddenly you're playing God a little bit, like race, boy versus girl, if the father's known or not. What if it's a child, a, a result of rape or um, drug use or uh, disability? And um, the one thing I can tell you someone told me is just uh, you're in the privacy of your marriage or, or you're, if you're doing it alone or with your lawyer, just be so brutally honest with yourself. Yes. And even though... There were good stories. I think my uh, our brutally honest answer is we'd been through so much we didn't want to take on um, more. So we wanted healthy and or seemingly healthy as you know as assured as we could be. And that seemed hard too because it's like can be beggars can't be choosers. Maybe a blind child we should be open to or a child of rape. We had a big long conversation about. Uh, Ian's like, well, that child wasn't, and I'm like. <laughs> Just don't want it. I don't know. I can't explain it. <laughs> so, it look, as yeah. my wife said, if you looked at a folder based on your parents, yeah. you yeah, wouldn't we, adopt. No, nobody would have picked us <laughs> if we were. You know. No, we realized that because when during we were During organ donors, donors, we're like, no chance. Yeah. Nobody would have picked us. Yeah. During egg yeah. donors, we still say that. Like, we would have eliminated ourselves so quickly. Mental and, and I'll tell you, obesity, And I'll tell you one, other, one other crazy story is that, uh, you know, in this crazy thing, I was reading an article, and, you know, there's a moment when everything you read seems... Like, it's, like, you know, important. Written for you? Yeah. And Einstein, when he was a student, uh, uh, he was dating his, that, who was going, this woman who was going to be his wife in the figure school. She got pregnant. They put up the kid for adoption. And I'm thinking about, wow. Einstein's right? Kid. Like, Einstein's kid is out there for adoption, right? <laughs> and, and, and it turns out that he married this woman. They had two other kids. One spent his life in an institution. The other one could never get out from under his father's shadow, right. and was never successful. So the moral is that you don't want to adopt Einstein's kid. You want to adopt Einstein's parents' kid. <laughs> and his parents were unremarkable in, you know, in every way. So you really can't second-guess these things. Um, I, I do, in a couple of minutes, want to open it up to your questions. Oh, that's kind of the most I important stuff. But, but just talk a little bit about, actually... Uh, how having a child you feel you wrote so beautifully made you a better person you felt and about how that experience of, of finally getting there. Um, yeah, well, I kind of felt and realized in my book that I had a very nice orderly life before Ian and mm -hmm. then before the St. Bernard, Ian talked me into getting that I thought we should wait and have a child first and it turned out I was so glad we had five years with this dog. And then with our baby who now, um, you know, we know all the babies in the neighborhood, we, it really means nothing that how she came to us except for that I feel so very lucky. And one other thing I didn't realize about adoption was because I hadn't had the child, um, I felt fine after the baby was born. So <laughs> most people are traumatized and, you know, so Ian and I both got to equally, um, like, feed the child at night, like, do, it was very equal from the beginning in a way that it's probably not with the child you give birth um, to. She's a deep sleeper, so it wasn't that equal. <laughs> 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 Her elbow was sharper than yours in the middle of the night, apparently. But we do feel so lucky. I mean, I, I don't feel, sometimes I meet people and think, just to adopt, you know, like, just, you, you, once it works for you, you think, you know, just get on the list already. But, um, you know, I feel, even though we're older parents, the thing that I was surprised about is we are the parents of a three-year-old now. And our peer group are the parents of three-year-olds. And they don't care how old we are. And I don't feel older than them or wiser. None of us know what the hell we're doing. <laughs> and we are all ruled by this three-year-old. So um, really doesn't seem to matter that we're older parents uh, in a way that I thought it might. And, and probably, except for that, it was harder to biologically conceive. I, I hope I can explain this right. The, um, I was always a, you know, we, we, you, we loved the two things that didn't come, that didn't come away. And then I, I was wondering if, if that means if there was some DNA connection there and if there's, some, if there's, if, if there's something that, um, and the reason I realized that you're worried about is, is anybody who has a kid, you just want you just want everything for that kid, and you want the, that kid to have everything that they could possibly have access to. And you might start blaming yourself, like there's some 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 well of love that you're not able to accept because of a biological disconnect, and and, and it's that's just absolutely crap. Um, 
I, I mean, any any adoptive father I know, any surrogate father I know, any don't anybody. They're all you. You're you won't. You, it is all of you, and it's the most of you that there can be, and you will get there. And and everybody, of course, tells you stuff all the time, and some of it you can't listen to, even if it's true. And a friend of mine said to me that when you're when you hold that child in your in your hands for the first in your arms for the first time, a little door will open in your heart that you never knew was there, that will expand your heart in ways you didn't think possible. And I remember literally the afternoon before, the night before uh, I was out to, our, our, we had our daughter, I was out to dinner with my wife and I was saying, listen, you know, the first couple of years, till the kid can go to the movies, I don't know if I'm gonna be so involved, <laughs> you know, <laughs> till I can really talk to her. And, right. You know, and, and the minute that child was born, I was in there, Yeah. you know, and you just, it's your kid. It's your kid. And you, you forget even everything that happened before. First of all, you don't have time. <laughs> but, you know, you're in it. You're in it. And, again, you're a parent by choice. So you're really uh, engaged and committed. So I'm going to open it up to questions. What I'm going to do is uh, someone's going to pass you a mic. Um, um, I have a small little request. If you want to make a speech... Save that for afterwards when you can go up to them. If you want to ask a question, please do. Go ahead. Um, what's the advantage of getting a lawyer involved? Yeah, a good question. Um, it really depends on what you're open to and uh, what, what you're open to, what your resources are. Um, I do have one of my dearest friends who's uh, adopted two years ahead of us. Uh, they didn't at all. They did it locally through Colorado. They just went straight there. Um, you know, we... Fortunately, we were in a position where we wanted to speed, speed it up along, maximize the amount of protections that we could. And also, I'm, I mean, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not an adoption lawyer. I didn't want to, I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I didn't want to go into that world uh, at all. I just wanted to have someone tell me what to do and, and, and have it get done. And that's, and that's pretty much what happened. I can tell you, uh, technically, because we actually try to see, because the Colorado system seems so sane. And Vista, let me explain how. So... If you use a lawyer, at least in California, a lawyer can advertise in little newspapers all over the country for pregnant women who want to give up the baby to adoption. And um, and then those little ads lead to that lawyer's phone bank. So David Radis had women calling him from all over. And he was actually very sensitive. He had been doing it for 30 years. Even those bedside manner, some people told us wasn't great. He was he, awesome. Um, he was able to weed through were they serious or not. He gave us advice like... This birth mother, uh, so she flew to, you know, he would call and say, there's a birth mother, she's seven months pregnant. I had these talking points. <laughs> we made these books, which I have at Vista Del Mar's um, <laughs> table, but we made these books about who we were as parents, and, I, and, and then I was... Arts and crafts in your 40s, which is Because like, the birth mother has to choose you, and she looks at this. Yeah, and some places do it online, but anyway... So and she thinks she's scrapbook. <laughs> yeah, and we made this scrapbook, and... Um, I would have to talk to the birth mother because the birth mothers are distrustful of men often because men got them in the situation. And um, and so I would be the one. And I wrote out and I just found when I came here my little talking points because David walked us through. Uh, I, and I was doing out like a pilot at the time. So I would be then some birth mother. You had to call right away because in L.A. people are calling right away. It's like a radio show. So you called. And the whole point was to try to just get to the point of making her feel comfortable that you could send your pictures and then if she was interested. And when you were telling that story, my very first call was some birth mother and it got like comically worse and worse. Like she'd been in jail. for She had another child. Her mother was taken care of. But she found out the child was a boy because her ex-husband had pushed her into a wall. So when she went to the hospital, she, you know, because he was an alcoholic. And it just got worse and worse. And I, and I didn't have in my talking points like, how to get off. So I was like, well, can I send you photos? <laughs> we'll get out of this later or something. I just realized. Cindy like, actually was a lot better, a lot better of, of, of setting, setting limits. I was, I was a little too gung ho. And I remember when one, one woman came out and she actually came out to interview us. It was a little, a little odd. Um, and then she, you know, she went, she went to the bathroom and my only thing was smoking. You know, that was, that was the only thing I was open to anything. And she came back and, and I was just like, oh, oh no. And I went home and I was like, ah, but actually what, the fifties, everybody was fine. <laughs> and he was like, no, we had these, you know, we had yeah, you these. Kind of talk. But, so 
So the David Ray is, so the lawyer um, can get these calls, and then if you are get, do it, get engaged with the birth mother, you need an adoption agency to do, or child service to do your home study. So Vista Del Mar got involved kind of on behalf of us and the birth mother, and it was nice to us. We felt like we wanted someone representing the interest of the birth mother too, and not to feel like we were buying a baby or taking someone's baby who didn't want to give it up. And so Vista interviews the birth mothers and we did courses through Vista with other adoptive parents and they did our home study, which was quite quite complicated, but whatever, we were more prepared than anybody we knew. <laughs> and we had letters of recommendation and you can't and even we believe. we got fingerprinted. We got fingerprinted. <laughs> but um, it's all kind of a, but anyway, by the end, uh, and then our gynecologist who was gonna deliver our baby, if we had a baby, was the one what I was going to say, David Reyes recommended that the birth mother, if possible, fly to you because, A, she kind of makes the decision before she gets on the plane that she's going to give up this baby, whereas sometimes if you fly, and we have friends who have flown to wherever the birth mother is, um, other family members might, or the, it's a very emotional time, or hormonally a birth mother might just decide, and I actually felt, even though there's horror stories about that for adoptive parents of people changing their mind, I just felt like if someone changes their mind, I don't want to... I don't want to take a baby anyway that way. And in fact, our last day at Vista, when we signed the paperwork, so we signed the paperwork before the birth mother left town. Um, and I should say, we were in the delivery room, which was kind of astounding, and something I, as a woman, never imagined standing by for the birth, but it was very <laughs> exciting, and now I understand what men go through. Um, but we, when she signed the paper, she was so emotional. And um, I said, we were alone with her, and the birth mother. And I said, are you sure you want to do this? And Ian... And looked I looked at Cindy like, are you freaking crazy? <laughs> 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 but I wanted to know. And she said, I'm, you know, I'm, it's sad and it's hard, but yes, I feel like this is the right thing. And I was so glad I asked because I wanted to know that she still wanted to give it. Did you try and contact with the birth mother? A little. I mean, I mean you, 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 you uh, set up what the terms are uh, by an agreement. And, and then you can do, and they usually advise that you set minimal terms, and then if you want to do more, that's fine. Um, and we set pretty minimal terms, and the, the birth father sort of wanted to jump out of the picture early on, and I was totally fine with that. And then the birth mother, we, we subscribed to the, the terms of our agreement. We send her pictures three times a year. There was a time when, and we'll have to explain this later on in life, but um, our daughter has uh, th uh, one full sibling and two half siblings. Uh, that are all all there, all all, and so we're gonna have to figure that out. There was a time when she wanted to involve them all. It was sort of an instant idea, like, hey, let's have a party and get. It. And I was like, no, I'm not. You know, that's outside of our agreement. I'm not okay. And we'll revisit that. You know, as as Olivia grows up. So what do, what David what what the attorney said, which which has proved true, is he said, in the first two years, there'll be a fair amount of contact, and then after that, the the birth mother moves on with her own life. And that's really been the case with us. There's a yearly sort of exchange of letters and photos and what's been going on. But it really, the first two years, there was a lot more and then it kind of tapered off. Yeah, our birth mother told us uh, she had a lot of need that first year for like seeing the first birthday, the first Christmas, the first, you know, she, and just hormonally you're still attached. And, you know, she, she, and really what I didn't understand is she wanted to see us really happy with the baby. I think we were sensitive that maybe we didn't want to seem too happy because it <laughs> felt like it was still her, her loss a little. But I think that's really what she wanted to feel good about. Uh, you, there's a question over there. Uh, microphone for her. What's the approximate cost of adoption? Let, let me let me uh, chime in on the uh, different lawyers have different fees, uh, and then the agencies that have fees, and then if you're going to go through, and there's a whole realm. And in theory, the idea is you're not supposed to have a system set up where people can buy babies, but 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 in practicality, sadly, that's that's true. Um, my friends who've gone through the Colorado system and the state system has has spent very little money, um, I think between six and twelve thousand uh, dollars, and that's been for everything, you know, for the whole process. Um, there's a uh, uh, but by the time insurance companies are pretty cold-hearted when it comes to adoption, for re you might she, the birth in our case the birth mother was insured, we were insured, and the birth was not covered, uh, which is just mind-boggling. You know, it's just absolutely mind makes no sense whatsoever. But it is what it is, and we were getting the baby, and that was that was, was going to happen. So it can be really high. The lawyers can be twenty-five thousand dollars or more or less. Uh, you can be obligated to pay for 
about four months of living expenses plus anything else, plus anything else, which can be pretty high, which is unfortunate, but it can be. Uh, the, inst the, the agency gets a, a fee. And on top of that, the state of California uh, has, uh, uh, you, have, you have to qualify. I represented uh, tons of women addicted to crack uh, as they had repeated babies again and again and again, and yet I had to make sure that I had to show people the state of California that my house was safe. But, um, and I had to pay them, I think, between three and $6,000 to show them that my house was safe, which is frustrating, but well, you get got, through but it. But then it felt like we paid a lot of money not to have a baby, so we were going <laughs> 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 to pay a lot yeah, of money exactly. to have a baby. And, exactly. and, and Mike, the, the mother qualified for Medi-Cal, and we didn't pay for, her, for, for the hospital fees. Right. Yeah, sometimes a birth mother's insurance is better than, yeah, you're out. It. Um, and also Vista, I know they do adoptions. Every once in a while they get local moms who come to them and, um, you know, or through the foster system, it's much less. So it sort of depends. But I, I, I do want to add, whatever it is, um, it's doable. Everybody I know. And everybody wants everybody to work I know, it out. It's doable. Whatever everybody it is, wants yeah. it to happen. They'll make all kinds of arrangements. That, that, you know, if they're in this right. business, they're in this business to help you succeed at this. That's their, that's their goal. Um, I think that's all the time we have, actually. Uh, Cindy is going to be signing copies of The Longest Date, Life as a Wife, uh, downstairs. Upstairs, I mean at the, um, it's upstairs, right? Yeah, upstairs. upstairs, upstairs. At, at the Vista Del Mar booth. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, download my uh, article on uh, the male uh, uh, journey of uh, infertility to adoption. That's called Motility, and it's on Amazon. And I want to thank Cindy and Ian for being thank such you. great guests. Thank you, guys. Oh, Thanks thank so much. Very much. And we thank Fora TV, and we thank uh, uh, Vista Del Mar, and we thank uh, Fertility Planet for today. Thanks. <laughs>